Hi, this is Tony McLaughlin, and I'm talking today with Zia Hyatt from CallSign. Zia, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you, Tony. How are you doing? Hey, Zia, I'm doing really well. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and the company you've built called CallSign. Uh, so my background is computer security, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, I did a PhD in cryptography about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, ended up working in the sort of defense and military world for, for the few years as my PhD was sponsored by BAE Systems. Um, uh, left there and, and, and worked in some management consultancies like Accenture. And ended up working in some big banks in, in, in the UK and the US as part yeah. of fraud and security teams. And from there, I realized that the need to be able to identify people is, is very important for lots of reasons. Firstly, to make sure that services are personalized when they're digital but then also to ensure that you're dealing with the right person, especially when you come to sensitive and critical services like banking, yes. et cetera, et cetera. And so I started call sign about uh, just over seven years ago now um, with that mission in mind, which is really, really to try and bring more accountability to the internet. So, uh, okay. That's so you, were, you were part of the, uh, the brain drain of PhDs into financial services. And, you know, when you arrived in, in the banks, um, you know, what kind of problems did you see that the banks were encountering in terms of, again, identifying their customers and uh, dealing with potentially fraudulent situations? Um, so there were, the, the, the challenges were varied, as you can imagine. Um, you know, yes. 10 years ago, there, there, were, there was a massive shift to, to just transacting and, and dealing with your bank online more and more. Yes. Um, most of the jobs that I did were focused on essentially gathering evidence with respect to transactions or events that have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Many of the systems that were in place were were there from a sort of like a bygone era, and, and a lot of them were were username and password based and things like this, where you yeah. If they were sophisticated, you get a one-time pin sent to you by your telephone and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but but most of the time it was pretty basic. And then you know I got into a world whereby essentially providing evidence around events that that were being disputed. Um, In other words, and, like the the non-repudiation of transactions. Yes, absolutely. You know whether it was first party fraud itself, so people who had done something and then were denying it, or whether it was indeed a third party that had performed a transaction in, in an unauthorized manner yes um, it became critical to start to understand um the digital dna and, mm. and you know the forensics around those transactions and what i found increasingly was that that dna just as in the human world um left fingerprints and footprints and all sorts of other things all over it and if you were able to sort of piece all of that together um then you could more often than not tell if it was the genuine person interesting they were essentially trying to come uh, or you could tell if it was actually not a genuine person it was clearly some third party and so is that the kind of founding insight that led to the creation of call sign that you you believed there was a an opportunity to create that digital footprint around i guess users and transactions by plugging into a range of different signals yes and so you know the the sort of the monitoring and the analysis of transactions has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people have been doing that for, for a while, even in the, the physical cards world and the physical transacting world. Increasingly, um, though, being able to identify an individual has become important because transaction monitoring itself can result in lots of false alarms. Indeed. Know, because we all do do things that are abnormal. You know, yeah. <laughs> so we do turn up at a shop that we've never been at before or a location. Yeah. we've never been to before and we do transact th and buy things that you've never done previously yes. but as long as you know that the person is who they claim to be um then clearly they should be allowed to do what they're trying to do indeed so you and saw that so, there was a danger perhaps of there being uh declines of transactions if the kind of uh, transaction monitoring was was too much predicated on a, a very set pattern of behavior indeed indeed and, and if you if you just if you, all you did was analyze the, the transaction behavior or the pattern, then, um, then yeah, you'd get lots of false positives. And I think 
a lot of the stuff that I've done previously was focused around retrospective analysis. You know, yeah. so when a transaction went wrong, you would be working with the police or someone else to try and help understand who had performed this transaction. Mm -hmm. And the thing that sort of really caught my eye was that imagine if you could use that data in real time I to see. help you make decisions that were more informed. And this is where we come up with this concept of call sign of intelligence driven authentication. I understand. So, so you, you're taking things that you were using uh, post facto after um, some sort of event had taken place. And then your, your key drive for bringing about call sign was to try to do that in real time as the transactions were flying. Absolutely. And, and therefore let hopefully the vast majority of people who are good through yeah. and then start to stop and, and interrogate and question yeah. those transactions and therefore those people where there was clearly something not quite right. So we live in, a, in, a, in an age of increased digital. Um, we live in an age of uh, you know, GDPR, the data protection regulation in Europe, which requires people to give informed consent. We live in an age of strong customer authentication of banking transactions that was brought in by PSD2. So how does your technology fit into this new environment that we find ourselves in? Um, that's a, a very good question, a critical question, especially given the fact that we are essentially trawling through lots of data in real time to try and identify you. And the best way to put it is that number one, we do, um, we do re require consent from the individual that is trying to perform a transaction. Yes. And I always say it's like when you walk into a petrol fork or, or a bank nowadays, you know, you, you're asked to take your helmet or your cap off because sure. you need to be able to identify yourself. And if you, if you're not prepared to do that, then you don't walk in. You know? Interesting. And so it's similar to, to the digital world. You know, we're asking people for their permission to, I, I understand. to I like identify that. themselves. I like that analogy. Now in, in the banking space, one of the recent, um, again, developments was this focus on strong customer authentication as a result of PSD2. And one of the complaints from, from merchants has been the friction that strong customer authentication brings into the customer journey. So I think that's also one of the areas of focus of call sign, which is to try to provide a strong customer authentication, but in a relatively um, customer friendly way. Could you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess um, we're all familiar with, second factor, two factor, multi factor authentication. Yes. We all, uh, you know, because of the way that those systems have evolved over the years, we all feel like those are tangible and explicit things. Mm. You've got to pull out a, a reader and it gives you a one time pin and you stick that one time pin into the system that you're logging into, for example, or that type clunky, of thing. Right? A bit clunky. A bit clunky. Yeah. A bit clunky. It might impact your conversion rates and all the rest of it. And as a merchant, you're probably not going to you don't want to get involved in a lot of that stuff. And mm -hmm. it, from what we do, you know, we are able to build up that multi-dimensional picture of someone and therefore authenticate them from multiple factors mm -hmm. without necessarily the person having to inconvenience themselves. Nice. And that's critical in order to, in order to just let people do what they want to do. You know, why, why do you buy things from certain retailers online and don't necessarily go to, the shops that you used to go to before just because it's easier. Mm. And, you know, I think that's, it's a critical thing, you know, that the whole, the whole move towards digitization is down to the fact that things are supposed to be more convenient. They're supposed to be quicker. And in fact, they're most supposed to be more secure. And so. Can you give yeah. us a sense of how you achieve that? I mean, how, how do you, if your technology is implemented at a bank, for example, then, how are you um, giving a, a kind of level of certainty that I am who I say I am or this transaction is valid without asking me to pull out my, my physical security device? So there are, a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies that we all exhibit when we interact with, um, with anything, actually. If you walk down the street and someone knew you, like even, even seen you once or twice, and the other side of the street, they'd probably be able to tell that you are Tony 
because of yes. the way that you walk. Hmm. When you're in the digital world and you're handling a smartphone, for example, when a mobile banking app asks you to swipe across it, for example, that's probably got our technology baked into it because that's what mm. something that we um, conceived of and, and built from the ground up. So, for example, we're able to tell, we're able to extract features like the strength of the wrist, the size of the hand, the size of the finger, other things, you know, just muscle memory in terms of how quickly you move across the screen, that type of thing, from a simple swipe across the screen or simply by typing your username. And so you don't necessarily feel it mm. um, uh, sort of, of overtly. So that's but fascinating. Things. So what you're saying is that there's a, you know, there's a bunch of sensors in a mobile phone, uh, you know, accelerometer, barometer, etc. cetera. And, and the way in which I interact with that device, it leaves a, essentially a unique fingerprint based upon my, my usage, which presumably because it's unconscious would be extraordinarily difficult for a bad actor to replicate. Yeah. So, you know, as I said earlier on, it's, it's all measuring muscle memory and muscle memory is something that we all exhibit subconsciously. You know, you, you don't, you don't even think about it. That's why it's, that's why it's driven by your muscle. Uh, Super interesting. That's, that's so what we're, we're measuring that. So then to the extent that, I, that you can build up uh, that kind of picture of me as a, as a user, uh, I mean, from a strong customer authentication perspective, perspective, does that actually count as a second factor? Yes. So if you look at the latest sort of EBA uh, directives and, and, and um, others from UK finance and, other, and similar such bodies, they're talking about the concepts of behavioral recognition. Mm. Um, where in particular this, this this concept of measuring muscle memory is, is something that comes out or, or recognizing the devices that you tend to use you know so that's a bit like the clothes that you wear yeah um, someone can tell it's you because you've got a particular jumper on um for example interesting so do you think i mean one of you know we're in this also era of again open banking combined with uh, gdpr and transactions these days, whether you're sharing data or doing a banking transaction, require um, a, an informed and explicit consent. Again, one of the um, constraints of take up of that has been the customer experience um, in terms of the authentication mechanisms that uh, companies have put in front of consumers so far. Do you, so do you think that this kind, your kind of technology has the potential for to, us to have what may seem to be an impossible combination, which is high security and frictionless customer journey. Um, that's, our, that's our number one objective. And, and, and it's the thing that you know, we, we aim to deliver to all of our customers, which is exactly that. You know, you, uh, maximum security, uh, minimum effort. And um, interesting. so that-, that, that well, My final question is here, you know, you're, you're um, you know, you're like all of, all the rest of us going through. I mean, we're all going through this experience in in real time. Um, but you're also the CEO of a fintech, mm -hmm. and um, I just went wondering at what your reflections are in terms of, you know, how how fintechs out there are, are coping with this uh, change, and you know, going forward as we move back to some semblance of normality, what are the the, the lessons that you've you've drawn from this? period from our business and, and also from our personal perspective? I think the um, firstly, so we, we, we do do more than financial services and, and therefore, you know, a lot of our clients, some of them are government sorts of organizations, that type of thing. Um, and so, you know, we've had to, we supply some of the departments of government that have been massively stressed during this period, for example. Yes. And um, I've tried to support them as best we can. Now, when it comes to the lessons learned during this period, I think, you know, just from a personal point of view, it's been fantastic to be at home more and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, be, be, be with your family and that type of thing. Agreed. Although, although in a way it's bad because you're just locked away in a room and, and they're near, so near yet so far, you know, so it's, in some ways it's probably worse. But luckily, touch wood, you know, we haven't been that affected as a business. But there are many, many businesses that have been affected by this whole situation. Um, and I think that, you know, the other the sort of lesson I've learned is that, um, is that the ways in which 
many of us thought that you had to work yes. are probably not true mm. for a lot of us. Clearly, if you work in retail, you've got to be in the, in the store, especially yeah. a, especially a, like a, a, an outlet, outlet based retail store, like a, an in-person situation. But for many people that work in the knowledge economy, yes, I think there's been a big eye opener, even for people like me, who probably thought they were really technically savvy and forward thinking and all the rest of it. There was still an element of feeling previously, I think, being candid that you needed people to be in and around you in an office environment to just be productive. Yes. Clearly, that's not the case. Clearly, yeah. what this thing has shown us is that you can be productive. Absolutely. But sat around your family, you know, I've got two kids and they, they shout and scream a lot, but you can still be productive <laughs> with them around. Absolutely. And I think that for me, the biggest thing has been that uh, I, I must admit, just, just yeah. understanding that, um, that there's a different way of operating, a different way of working yes. that doesn't need you to burn fossil fuel and get somewhere for half eight in the morning. Um, just because you have to be there at half eight in the morning, nine o'clock. I think there's a different way. Well, Zia, you're certainly operating at the forefront of um, what I think will be one of the foundations of the digital space going forward. Again, we need to square the circle of high security and good customer experience. Um, so it's been fascinating to hear your insights today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Chase Hyde. Thank you. Thanks.